Welcome to today's webinar. My name is Blake Bauckham, and I'm the Director of Sales for Osteogenics. Before we get started, let me address how we will be interacting today. From a technical perspective, we can't hear or see you, but we would love to interact with you. So to that end, there's a question and answer button on the right-hand side of your screen where you can type your questions at any time, and we will try to get them answered during the webinar. I'm going to introduce Dr. Gallo, my friend. Dr. Gallo received his DDS in Columbia in 2002. He then completed his specialty certification in periodontics at the Universidad Latinoamericana de Mexico in 2005, as well as a fellowship in implant dentistry at the Universidad de Miami Miller School of Medicine in Bogota, Colombia in 2012. He's also completed a PhD in implantology at Sao Paulo Mandique in Brazil in 2020. Dr. Gaia was a national and international lecturer on periodontics and advanced surgery, as well as soft tissue, bone regeneration, and dental implants. He has been a professor at multiple dentistry and periodontics programs in universities throughout Columbia. Dr. Gallo, I'm super excited to hear your lecture today. You're a wealth of knowledge on this topic, and I think our audience is going to be really pleased with the message that you delivered. Hello, so can you, you hear me? Yes. I cannot, I cannot hear uh, Blake. Okay, there you go. Okay. Okay. Yes. Perfect. So I okay, perfect. made a good introduction, but, uh, but yeah, you're, you're, you're good to go. Can't wait to hear the presentation. Thanks so much for joining us today. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Blake. Um, hello everybody. Um, I want to special thanks to osteogenics for this opportunity to present my work or what I've been doing the few 18 years of my practice. And thanks, Blake, for, for your kind introduction. And, and I'm going to start right away. So um, we decide to, to do this webinar to talk about clinical realities of vertical reach augmentation. So I'm not going to talk about what I, what I have learned from my professors. I'm going to talk about the realities of my clinical practice in Bogota, Colombia, with my Latin America patients with uh, a patient that has different um, behaviors than U.S. patients or European patients. So um, with this introduction, I want to specify my presentation on vertical bone augmentation, on vertical defects. So the first question that I'm going to, to, to make is, what do we need to do a vertical reach augmentation? And it's a very easy answer because I divide it in, 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 any, in very important topics, even one more important than, than the other one. So let's start with, with, with a patient. What type of patients do we need to do a predictable reach augmentation? Because we can learn the technique and we can take a lot of courses, like, a, a lot of courses like I did, with Professor Urban, Sasha Jovanovic, Maximo Simeon, Carlo Tinti, a lot of great doctors and great mentors, but they don't, they don't teach you how to select the patient. You can learn the technique, but you reply the technique in your practice in the wrong patient. So in my, in my experience, I choose a patient with uh, younger than 70 years old. Why? Why 70? Okay. Why not 69 or 71? Because that's, that's the number that I want. 70. Because I think, I strongly believe that older than 70 years old, you can do a lot of treatment. You can do a lot of, you can give the patient a lot of solutions, a different solution, better, simpler, and even um, softer and cheaper than a vertical reach augmentation in all the dental zone and all the dental patient with, with older patient and uh, systematic pro problems and periodontally a problem. So I choose a patient that can be treated with a very good hygiene. So Periodontal healthy is important. Systematic patient is important. I prefer to do this treatment for patients to suffer of partially edentulous because totally edentulous, 
You can treat it with zygomatic implants, cytot leaf, two, four implants, and, 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 a, and a prosthetic, a total prosthetic that can be removal, anything else. But this particular vertical limitation with no resolvable membrane, I prefer to do it in, per in partial edentos. And the most important that I have learned through the years and through suffers also is psychological stable. Because a patient who don't understand what is going to be a vertical surgery, who, a patient who don't understand uh, uh, the, the compromise, the, the discipline, the, the conscience of this surgery, if they don't understand that, please don't treat with that patient with this kind of procedure. A patient who comes every appointment late, who asks for some stupid questions, uh, 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 some uh, ask for a lot of discount. I don't know if it happens in Europe and US, but here in Latin America is a disaster. That patient that complains for everything, that has some fights with, with the receptionist and they suffer for everything, their life is a chaos, don't treat that patient. Send it to psychologist or psychiatrist first and then come back and treat the patient for this very difficult type of surgery. Okay, the next one is the defect. Okay, I, I noticed that I passed one slide. Okay, the defect, there's a lot of different, but we, we have to understand what type of defect can be predictable regenerated. So a vertical defect is a, is a bone defect that means vestibular wall and palatal wall. So you have to find some bone peaks on mesial and distal to be treated. And that's the only dimension of bone regeneration that you can do. You cannot do more than that. Okay. It's impossible. Also, you can understand that our horizontal defect cannot or should not be treated with non-resolvable membrane. Why? Because the collagen membrane works very fine and the literature said has less complication than non-resolvable membrane. So we have to do, we have to find the easy way, always find the easy way for your patient to treat this defect. So horizontal is not for non-resolvable membrane. A barrier. There's two barriers that I like a lot. I've been working with osteogenics and cytoplasm membrane at PTFE Dense uh, for very long years um, with a lot of success and a lot of complications also that we're going to discuss at the end of the presentation. So these two membranes, this is the new membrane, the RPN uh, has a little holes in the membrane. For, to be honest, I'm not the best guy to, to, to talk about that because I have, I haven't treated a hundred patients with a, with a perforate membrane, but so far I haven't seen difference on, 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 on membrane with, with better results. I, I got very good results with both type of membranes with no complication, with very good flood management, with very good um, uh, selecting the patient and treating the exactly the correct defect. Also, we, we have to, 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 to share with you our work that we did in 2018 with a group of Peruan scientists. We, um, post or we, we publish an, 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 an case series of 35 consecutive bone augmentation or vertical bone augmentation. And for those 35 cases, we have nine complications. We don't, um, we, how do you say, we don't, uh, dismiss, we don't, we don't, uh, hide our complication. We talk about complication. We learn from our complication and every complication is a lesson to the next case to do better. So. In, in the media bone range of regeneration, we did 5.45 millimeters. And the conclusion was that vertical limitation is a very predictable, um, surgery and, and, and with, with non-resolvable membranes is a very predictable and, and safe 
way to do that compared to another technique that you can find on the learning tree. Let's talk about the bone field. And this, because I have the opportunity to go to a lot of, a lot of countries in Latin America, this is the factor, this is the, 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 the most important factor that I find when the people have more deficiency. Why? Because people think that we can do or you can do a vertical augmentation only with graft. And that's not true. And that's a mistake. And that's a fallacy here. Because you need, you need, the 100% of the time, you need autogenous bone. So you have to learn how to extract autogenous bone, how, how to prepare autogenous bones, how to, to buy some scrapers, some trefines, some meals, everything to get autogenous bone. We always ask, what is the best combination? Should I mix autogenous bone with allograft or should I mix autogenous bone with xenograft? And there's few. I don't want to do, I, I, I don't want to say there's none, but there's few articles that talk about that. And we have the opportunity to, to do this, this research with a great group of scientific when we compare both materials, uh, allograph with autogenous and xenograph with autogenous. In 24 biopsies from 16 patients with the need of vertical augmentation, we divided in two groups, a group A with allograph with autogenous in a radio of 1-1 one, one, with two, two, uh, 12 biopsies, and group B with two xenographs and autogenous, autogenous bone and also 12 biopsies. The results that we got in the Eastern morphometric uh, assignments was the vital mineralized tissue that it's equal to bone to mineralized bone. We didn't find uh, a, a, a significant difference between both biomaterials, okay? So these biomaterials could work very good in the procedure. Also, we need to find and we need to discuss about long-term results, uh, volume, um, bone crest uh, stability on, 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 on years, but both biomaterials work very good for vertical reach augmentation. So what is the percentage? I, I remember that Professor Maximo Simeon talked in the early, in the early 20s, uh, 2000s, um, of a radio of, of, of 50, 50, one on one. Now the same doctor talks about 70% of autogeno, 30% of biomaterial. So we need to take autogenous bone that provides cells, BNPs, growth factors that no one graph, uh, can do the same job as autogenous bone. Oh, uh, one, two, three, four, five point. The fifth point, the fixation. There's two fixation systems that you can use. A screw that you can use the profix screw or sales drilling is, it's an automatic sensation. Um, because you don't, you don't need to, to, to hurt anybody. And you can do it or manual or with a hand piece. Even in, in difficult access to, because anatomic uh, position, you can do it with a handpiece and works very fine. That screw changed my life in bone regeneration when I met this group. Also, you can do it with the collagen membrane, but I recommend you to, to stay the collagen membrane so, so stretched because you don't, you don't want to, to wrinkle the membrane with the screw that it could possible happen. Another, another system is pins or tacks, whatever you can, you can call. It's a deal for collagen membranes to do the, the, the famous sausage technique, but it's a traumatic sensation. And I, and I, and I tell you, because of my experience, I prefer to sedate the patient to, to a state of, uh, to, to treat a sleepy patient 
with sedation to do this procedure because you don't want, trust me, you don't want to be hurt with a, with some, some, um, um, some hammer in, in, in your mouth. You can also do pins with, with uh, Teflon membranes and works very good. The thing is, when you try to put the lingual pick, the lingual tag is very complicated. So it's better with, with, with profits screw. This is the most important uh, topic because the flat management, the flat management give you or a big success or a big failure. And I learned that in 2013 with Professor Isban Urban in Los Angeles, and he told me how to manage the flat. And he, for me, it was a before and after. So in anterior, superior, anterior maxilla, we do a little, a gentle cut of the periosteum and the submucosa and stretch the flap to release the tension and to take the the flap to cover all the teeth around the differ. That's very important to cover all the teeth around the differ. That's when you said, okay, it's done. In lean, in, maxi, in mandibular, in mandible, you can make a coronal event flap with a gentle coat, especially with 15C. You do a coronal movement of the periosteum and the flap should reach the incisal edge of the tooth, of the, of the, of the teeth close to the defect. So you have to take on mind that it has to be an equal elevation. It's not only omission that is easier. You have to go to distal also and in the middle as well. And the lingual is, is very easy, is the easiest part, is the patient has no history of surgeries uh, before yours that, that, that you're doing, you don't need to cut the periosteum. But if the patient has history that suffer from a lot of vertical augmentation previous to your surgery, I recommend you to use some, some scalpel, some, beast, some, some, some cutting of the periosteum because you will find a thick periosteum because every, uh, every healing of the periosteum is get thicker. So it gets the periosteum thicker. So you should cut a little bit. But if it's, if it's a, if it's a virgin periosteum, like no one has, uh, doing some surgery on that periosteum, you can do it like you're doing like you're seeing on the video, only push. And this searcher was published in 1998 by Professor Carlo Tinti, was the first one who talked about two types of, of, of sutures, the, the horizontal matrix and the simple interruptum sutures. It's very simple, really, it's very simple. I prefer to do it with a Teflon Cytoplast 3 zero suture with a triangle needle. And the other one, you can do either of Teflon suture or cytoplasm, maybe four zero works very fine, or nylon, okay? Whatever you, you, you like. So let's, let's go to the practice, okay? Let's put all these all this little quickly concepts to practice, okay? This is a patient that comes with periplantitis in both, in both sides of the mandible. So the best treatment, you know, of periplantitis is take those, those simplest out. I mean, don't, don't, don't waste time, don't waste money, don't waste biology. The better treatment is remove those implants and go vertical augmentation. So that's what we did. So this is a, this is a clinical defect. I, I sacrificed, okay, the premolar and the molar because I have to choose I have to choose the higher bone peak levels. So I sacrifice those two to go vertical, I mean, distal and mesial with the bone peaks. Then I, I had a mix with 70% of autogenous, 30% of uh, C core. That's the, the scenograph that, that I'm working. So this is the result of the bone augmentation, 12 months later, I wait in those, 
in this kind of, of a big um, augmentation, because I don't use growth factors, I don't use BMPs, I only use autogenous with SQL. And I wait two, 12 months. And then, this is the, the, the before and after, and then we, we, we can, we can, we ask for, for a digital help. We go and, and select where we're going to place the implant. We always choose to put the last implant ever. How, how many implants can you resolve this case? Which, how many implants can you resolve that case? With two? Okay, place two. Don't play three. Place two. Okay, the minimum implants that the patient is required, that's the best option for the patient. So we place both implants with guy implant surgery, and then we make um, a square, a little square, a guide for soft tissue grafting. So we put this, this paper that can be sterilized and go to the palatal, and we took uh, the first soft connective tissue graft that a uh, vertical augmentation needs. Because if you are the people who think that the vertical augmentation doesn't need or don't need a uh, soft tissue graft, I'm sorry to tell you, my friend, but you are wrong. Because every, every bone augmentation needs a soft tissue graft. I don't use substitutes. I don't buy substitutes. I don't waste my money buying uh, new materials that is coming to the market. I prefer to go to the palatal of the patients and take it from the patients and take it from the same patient. I don't care if the patient complains about hearts. I put up a plate, um, a surgical plate um, for the palatal to avoid the, the, the discomfort because I know it hurts. I know it hurts. Okay, so this is the result. And then we go to the second surgery. Why? Because every time you do a vertical augmentation, you lose the keratinized mucosa. Every time. Even the defect has no keratinized mucosa. You go up with the, with, with, with the stretch mucosa and you have to keratinize. The best way to keratinize is the, is what I, what I'm going to tell you right now. The first one where I did is to remember the distance of the patient, the distance of the implants. I put the same guy surgery. Okay. To give me a, 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 a help, a, a guy for, for how, how bigger is going to be the, the flap that I have to do to insert or to place the soft tissue graft that it would be a free gingival graft. And also I noticed that this type of, I'm sorry, that in the premolar, I forgot that I cannot use it. The premolar has lost the keratinized mucosa. So I, I, I have to involve the premolar. So my, my flap is going to be very big. So the graph is gonna be it's gonna be bigger. I go with an incision of a partial incision. I leave periosteum above the bone and go apical. It's, a, it's an apical vestibular position of the flap and place a big free gingiva from the palatal. Even I took some. Um, some tissue from, from the anterior part of the palatal and place it on the distal, we have no problem with the scar. I don't, I don't, I don't, put, I don't place a lot of sutures. In my beginning of my careers, I had, I, I had this pre gingival graft and I took two, two boxes of surgery and flapping and, and suturing all the flap. No. Less is better. Less is more. So I place a very specific position of the sutures and let it heal. And this is a healing of 14 days. And this is a beautiful healing two months later. Look how the beautiful keratinized mucosa underneath the premolar. That's for avoiding a, a, a posterior res gingival recession. And this is the own cover of the implant.
In this case, is better. This case is ready for the prosthetic phase. That is first provisionals and then final crown. So we always have to remember where we come from. Look where we come from, from the patient. Look where we are now with vertical reach augmentation. That's the good things of vertical reach augmentation. That's what I love doing vertical reach augmentation to return to the patient what they have lost. So let's go to aesthetic zone. Let's go to a big scenario, a very disastrous scenario with very complex patient with some psychological traumatic situations. Um, you cannot imagine how, how um, I cannot say that bad words here, but it's um, a very, very damaged psychological with, with, with this patient. So I, I had to help it and I have to, to return the faith of the, of the, of the, of the dentist to return the, the, the willingness of, of, of doing this procedure because he suffered a lot. So the first thing that I, that I noticed is that the, the bone crest is very, very reduced on, on, on the central and the canine. So I have to extract that, those two to get the most coronal crest to pretend or to um, do all my effort to do this augmentation with the best bone peaks on the coronal sides. So the first surgery, the, the first surgery is remove those two. So a lot of questions uh, from if, if I can, uh, can I do a, a, a socket preservation in this case? If you're going to do a vertical augmentation, you, you don't have to waste money to place graft on the socket because you have to remove it in six months or maybe three months because you're going to do a vertical augmentation. And I prefer to let those uh, socket healing by themselves instead of placing material that is going to interfere with the healing. So I prefer to do nothing. And I always do this stand with this pro provisional and go home. I don't want to see you in the next three months. So you come back. I need to see you. I need you to tell me that everything's good, that those type of patients that they want you to every time tell you it's okay, it's okay, don't worry, you're not gonna die, you're not gonna die, you only need to do implants, three tooth, but they think that they're gonna die because they suffer uh, autoesteem, self-esteem, and 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 and, and their life is a mess, okay? Because those of missing tooth. So I prefer, uh, in this case, to use a curi technique. It's a, a split bone block technique. I took a block from the patient and I place it in the defect and fix it with, with a, a micro screw and let it heal. And I was so uh, happy with those techniques because I learned another technique and I wanted to, to try it in a patient and I close everything good and look what happened one month ago. The flap came open. I want to jump from my, from my building. I work in the seven building as you can see. I want to jump right away and I didn't know what to do because that's autogenous bone, that's necrotic bone. There's no membrane. We're gonna talk about exposure of membranes uh, in, a, in, a, in a few minutes, but there's exposure of real bone, of, of, of bone graft, of autogenous bone graft. So my, my blood runs with Latin American situation and everything. I say, okay, it's open, let's close it, okay? If it's open, let's close it. Okay, let's take a uh, Soft tissue graft, decipitalize the, the, the free gingival graft. They take a soft connective tissue graft and put it underneath with a tunnel technique and close. And after the close, pray. Because if you don't pray, this is going to be a disaster. And I'm not a huge prayer. So two months later, 
come worse, the worst scenario ever. So uh, right now, if I didn't jump in the first scenario, there's no way that everybody can change my mind of jumping. Okay. But I have to give the patient a solution. I cannot be that guy who, who has a, <laughs> that complication. Say, okay, I'm going to kill myself. Okay. Say, say hello. Go back. No, I have to, I have to get very serious and treat that patient. So the first situation or the, the, the very honest situation is open. Remove off the tissue that is moving. Leave those tissue that is very, very stick to the, to the natural bone, to the, to the, to the pristine bone. Leave that tissue clean. Everything is clean. Remove all the tissue that is moving. That's the key. Leave it. You don't have to scrap. You don't have to go with a blur. No. You just remove it with a gauze, with, with a curette and close and wait. Okay. Then the patient came back four months. So I opened and said, okay, I failed with the second best technique that I know. Okay. That is a split ball block technique. So I have to go with the first technique that I know. And for me is the best one. So you, you probably gonna have, uh, you're gonna ask yourself right now is why didn't put the membrane in the first surgery, and I'm going to ask you why. The patient didn't live at that time in my, in, in my city, in Bogota. So if the patient didn't live in Bogota, if the patient do, doesn't live in Bogota, in, my, in the city where I live, if I cannot have the follow-ups of this vertical augmentation, I prefer to do another technique, even short implants sometimes. Okay, but that was the reason that I preferred to do another technique. So I have to, um, how do you say? I have to ask for uh, forgiveness to my wife after I yelled, unfortunately. And I said, okay, so uh, Teflon membrane, I'm sorry, to, I didn't choose at the first time. I'm going to, 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 to do it in the second time. Please forgive me, goddess of the, of the PTF membrane. So I have to do it in the second time. So I pray a lot of forgiveness, uh, phrase and I use my, my, my preferred membrane. So I, I, I use autogenous 60% and C core in 40%. In that mix, I place it. And I use a lot of profits. I know there's a lot of profits, but I guarantee that that bone graft not going to move. And the first suture technique was very different with this one. In this one, I already got my, my, my loot that I, that I, that I, that I, I, I do surgery with magnification. So I, I take care about the very suture reposition of the flag because I know how to, how to management, but the, 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 the suture technique is the most difficult is the, is the sherry of the pie. You know, you cannot do, or you cannot expense a lot of, a lot of money or investment in your materials and do a nasty, nasty suture. So I have to take very careful of the suture and the gods of the, Teflon membrane helps me a lot. So I passed the, the two months, uh, healing time. And, and we're going to discuss a little bit about that. And if I pass the two months, my rate of complications go very, very, very low. So this is a four month follow up. And let's try <clears throat> to do two implants. Instead of three, I go two implants. Always I go two implants. So I designed very, very systematically, very automatically of the implants, of the position. I choose the surgical guy. I help me with this um, technology. And this is one of the reasons I place two implants instead of three or uh, three with a bridge. My friend, Andrea Radiva, um, made this interesting 
research and he found that the second scenario when you do a bridge with two implants is the best scenario for avoid perimplantitis, prothesis complication, uh, loss of marginal bone. So there is no way rather than you want to make money a lot that you have to place three implants. There is no way you can place two implants without any consequence, without any problems and beautiful long time results. So I prayed a lot in this case and I removed the day. This is the best important, this is the most important day for my clinical cases. The day that I have to remove the membrane and place those implants. That's, I, I, I woke up happy. I, I, I take a shower in 20 minutes. I, I spend a lot of time of me because I'm going to be happy removing that member. So I found that, that bone, the beautiful amount of bone. I place those implants. A, 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 a most, um, a prosthetic guidance. Uh, I mean, I cannot have any error with surgical guide in the prosthetic position of the flap. But in the apical position, I miss bone, right? So what I have to do is a vertical bone regeneration, a horizontal bone regeneration with a C matrix, C matrix, I call it in Spanish C matrix called C matrix it's a collagen membrane very beautiful membrane because you 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 can straight the membrane and place pig ping or tags on the membrane and we focus on regenerate the apical portion and that's it I will never going to remove that pink again I will never open again and always play soft connected tissue graph to gain vertical soft tissue augmentation. I don't use substitutes. I go to the palatal of the patient. I stabilize with a suture and I close every, every flat as good as I could. And I place a provisional and I don't want to see you in the next three months. So it came back at three months. So we need to um, um, uh, change the keratinized mucosa. So I have to remove those flaps and change to keratinized mucosa. So I did a partial flap and I go to both sides of the palatal. I took two connective tissue grafts and place it in the most important area that I needed. Which are the most important areas that I needed? The area when the crown is going to meet the implant. When the abutment is going to meet the implant, that's the most important. And because I haven't more palatal to take the connective tissue graft that is, 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 a, is, a, is a contraindication of a limit size of the soft tissue graft, I take, or I have to, to, to take a collagen matrix, a new one that come, uh, I, I, I don't know what brand was. I mean, I do not intend to, to talk bad about, uh, about that branch. So, my patient was like a Freddy Krueger and go home. So when he come back, the mucosa returned coronally. And even I had keratinized mucosa around my future crowns, I, I, I wasn't happy. So with no charge at all, because a lot of surgery here is free of charge, I uncovered the implants and said, okay, because you're here, my friend, <laughs> and you're not gonna go anywhere, I'm gonna go to the palatal again, I'm gonna remove that um, keratinized tissue, I'm gonna place a soft connective tissue. Why soft connective tissue graft instead of free gingival graft? Because the scar. A free gingival graft is more than posterior zone, and a soft connective tissue graft is for anterior zone. So that's only soft connective tissue. Now. I just removed the epithelium and he came back. And was beautiful the scenario. 
but I'm not happy at all. I'm I'm very difficult guy to 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 please to to get satisfied. So I I got some black triangles. I say okay, let's remove the the crowns. Let's play in a tonal technique. Let's play some keratinized um some some thick tissue from tuberosity and less suture in Corona. And that's the situation yesterday that he came back to remove the suture. It was very beautiful a scenario, remembering where he started. Okay? This is how he came with a disaster of, of with a mine of disasters with a lot of psychological problems. And here's now, and the most interesting thing, thing is he, he's keeping the same psychological problem. So this is an un, unscientific evidence that tooth and bone regeneration cannot help psychological patients. <laughs> and now I, I know Stephen is laughing, I know. So, uh, unfortunately, not everything is frozen. And, and we have to talk about complication be, because it, it, if you go a lot of surgeries, you do a lot of surgeries, I mean, come on, you're not God. You, 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 probably you are very uh, skillful doctor, but you chose the, 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 the bad patient or even the patient didn't, um, didn't, uh, uh, find the same indication that you gave them or they lost the paper of the post post indication and everything is, is a messy. So why do complication happens and, 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 and how do we manage them? I, I have a lot of complication. I'm not ashamed to do, to, to say that because I do a lot of these procedures. And at the beginning of my career, I had a lot of complication until I took uh, uh, courses and, and train myself and practice on, on, on real patient to, 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 to better understanding the, 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 the skill situation that I can, that I can make to this, these procedures predictable. So let's talk very quickly. You can have a, a very, uh, tiny perforation with no protoline exudate, no infection, no, no symptoms, no pain, no edema, nothing. Okay. Uh, this is one of the classification that we, we have been working and we recently published. But the first thing that you have to do when you have this little complication is take a CT, CBCT because you need to guarantee that the graph is not resorbing. Okay. You're not losing grad. So you can keep the, you can keep the exposure clean with follow-ups, a weekly, a weekly follow-ups and nine months. I guarantee you that you won't lose any bone at all. Okay. Because there's no infection, there's no symptom, there's no pain, there's no edema, there's nothing. It's only a tiny exposure that you can keep clean and patient can have the implant five years follow up and has no uh, bone loss. And the situation is, is good. It's not excellent, but it's good. Okay. But that situation that you want to jump out your building is the situation that you see a lot of membrane exposure. So if the patient has no purulent exudate, you have to remove the membrane between the six and the 12 weeks. Okay. So this is what I did. I removed the membrane because a lot of membrane has exposure. So I have to pull the membrane and there's a, there's a pseudo periosteum underneath the membrane that forms exactly when you do a sucker precipitation, like a Dr. Barbie technique, with a, with a cytoplast TXT membrane that formed a, a soft tissue underneath that membrane. You have no, exp you have no infection or no purulent exudate, have no problem. Look, the situation five months, 14 months, and when you open, you're gonna find bone. I guarantee you, you're gonna find bone. So that bone allows you to place the implant. This is a, 
a five years follow up with a tiny significant uh, bone loss uh, of the bone crystal bone or the bone crystal level at the bone crystal level. Yeah. But the situation, if you have some puddling exudate, it is different because you have to remove the member right away because you have an infection. You have do you you change the pH of the of the mucosa, so there's no way that it's gonna pour bone. So I suffer of ignorance and I place that implant. Even I know right now that you don't have to place those implants in the in the same time you remove that contaminate membrane. So I have to ex I have exposure of the implant, so I have to go to the to free gingival graft to, to cover that exposure. I did a little bit of, of, of covering that implant and the final result with with um, with crowns and, and and veneers, you can have a little bit of of of, of a good aesthetic at the end. But I suffer a lot because I place the implant in the same time of remove the membrane. And if you don't see the membrane, if you don't see the membrane, but you have an abscess or, or a princess or a fistula, or you have an infection, you have, you, you right away, you see it in the x-ray and you see the resorption of the bone graft because of the infection. So you have to be quickly and remove the membrane to prevent more resorption of that bone. And you have to wait, you have to be patient because at the end of the nine months of healing, you're going to find bone to place those implants. And this is a seven year follow up of those implants. So I, I know I, I run out of time. So this is, this is, a, um, I'm going to take one minute more. Uh, I, I, I'm, I, I hope it's okay. This, uh, this is a research that, that we did in 2019, uh, that I think is, is, is one of my, uh, my important, uh, um, research and in, in, in this field that we summarize all the complications that we had between 2010 and 2017 and the amount of complication was a little bit of 80 complications and so we processed that complication that information and we knew how to how to how to management and with the protocol that we invent with this with this kind of complication, because to tell you the truth, nobody taught me how to manage complication, not even the greatest doctors, nobody was my uh, control error. Let's do this, didn't work, let's do that, didn't work, let's do this, oh, this is working, oh, like that. So we had that 55 of 80 complication was exposure of the membrane. They, they weren't, uh, exudate purulent. So there's more frequently exposure than an infection. 70% to tell the most important of this article, 70% of the complication occurred within two months. That's significance. <coughs> Sorry. That's, that significance that the first two months for the postoperative surgery, this, this, the, the, that is the most important first month for me. So if the patient live in US, Europe and travel to Colombia to get surgery, I require, I require them to move to Colombia two months at least to guarantee to, if I have any complication, I treat it right away. So this is uh, another article that you can download from my, from my webpage. And this is a, the, the latest complication the latest classification of the complication, with, which, which we did with Mel Groom, a great guy, a great guy from Holland or uh, um, Netherlands, I don't know how they call them, I, I, I mean, I'd say Holland. So this is a class one, it's an it's a exposure of the memory without any purulent exudate, but we did, or we, or we um, um, proposed that if the membrane the edges of the membrane is covered by tissue has a different behavior that is, is not covered by tissue. So this is an important factor because there is, I mean, it's different if you are in a room 
and you are cold is different if you have the, 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 the door closed or door open. If you have the door open, you have to close it. If you have the door closed, you have to turn out the heat. I don't know, but it's different situations. So you have to read it because if you want to treat your patient with non resolvable membrane, this is a very guide for you. Okay, this is a, a flow charge that it says that if you have purulent exudate, if you don't have a purulent exudate, what class uh, have you on, on your case? If the agents of the membrane uh, cover, yes or no, it's yes, you have to remove it between six and 12 weeks. If no, you have to ask yourself, okay, when the complication appear, appear less than two weeks or more than two weeks, because that's when mature of bone, it's in present of the, underneath the membrane. If you don't have sufficient mature of the tissue, you have to remove it before the membrane is contaminated and gets infected. So this is a clinical scenario that with those uh, classification, with those management, you can take this case with a very good scenario and change a very bad situation in a very good scenario with a patient that won't do you. <laughs> so my conclusions, and I, uh, I'm sorry to, to, to take more time that, that, that I had to, the vertical reach augmentation is a highly operated sensitive technique and as each step is critical to its success. However, by performing each step, Perfectly. We may have cases that we were in regeneration is not achieved a hundred percent. So we're gonna have to think or another regeneration or a soft tissue to make those crowns less longer than is gonna be. Soft tissue graft is necessary for vertical bridge augmentation and ensuring long term results. You can find a, a lot of literature saying that management complication definitely increase the predictability of optimal results in vertical reach augmentation. I'm very happy to have the opportunity to, to do this presentation. Uh, I, you guys know how, how much I love uh, working with, with you or with your materials. And I feel free to ask anything. And I'm very happy and thankful for this the opportunity today. Thank you very much. Yeah, well, Dr. Gallo, the pleasure is all ours. Thanks for thanks for agreeing to give us some of your time and go over the presentation. I've always respected how you you approach complications head on. It's not you're not hiding from them. We know that they're there. Let's understand what the complication is, what's causing it, and then we'll directly uh, address that mm. through different surgical protocols and in the literature that you've developed on that with. I know you have your own article and you also have now one with Dr. Vroom. Uh, that, that's really helpful to, to everybody that experiences those. So thanks for your, your work that you've put in along those, uh, those topics along the way here. So there are a couple of questions that have come in. Um, if you have additional questions, please use that question and answer button there on the top right hand of your screen. We'll try to get through as many of these as we can. We've got about five minutes left here uh, in the event. So the first question, uh, Pierre, is all about the treatment and, and how are you preparing the exposed cementum of adjacent teeth before you, you handle one of these vertical ridge augmentations? Are you cleaning it? Is there a, a pref gel? What, what's your, your clinical uh, indication there? Okay, it, that, 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 that's a very good question because if the patient has not periodontal disease, you, can, you, you don't have to do anything. But, the, but is the patient those, those, uh, that premolar or that adjacent tooth that is closer to the, to the, to the regeneration, when you open the flap, you see calculus, you see periodontal disease, you have to scanning and cleaning, okay, do root planning. And if you work with breath gel to decontaminate the, the, the root, works very fine. But you don't have to you, to use endogain to improve the 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 regeneration of, of of the bone because I mean it's not what we're going to do. We're gonna treat the vertical defect. Is that is the tooth or the any tooth?
has periodontal disease or needs a uh, 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 teacher regeneration guy or guy teacher re re guy teacher regeneration, you can use those techniques before the vertical augmentation. So you have to treat the, pe the periodontal patient before vertical augmentation. That's the best scenario. You, we have to prepare a healthy patient to do vertical augmentation or vertical reconstructions. So even in the cases, so let, let's say the patient has zero um, contributing factors going in, there's no periodontal disease, mm -hmm. and you're intraoperative, mm -hmm. I, I assume you're still using a scalar to make sure the tooth is completely clean before you go through the procedure. Is that part of the protocol? Okay. Yeah, perfect. yeah, yeah, perfect. So the next question then but, is... But um, I don't treat it like a disease tooth. I don't treat it like a disease yeah. tooth, okay? Okay, sure. perfect. Um, some of these are a little simpler. So what suture material are you using for the free gingival graft? Uh, nylon, nylon five zero. Okay. Five nylon zero, five zero. Nylon. Exactly. Um, and this yeah. question is one I don't understand as well. So forgive me if I mispronounce it, but when you're talking about the soft tissue grafting, the vestibuloplasty that you do after the vertical mm -hmm. augmentation, the question is, mm -hmm. can you use a uh, Kazanjian vestibuloplasty? And I, I, don't... I, I, I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's good. It's good. Okay. It's good. Okay. Um, I have seen some doctors who uh, do those procedures and the cases that they show, they, they can gain vestibular deepness. I mean, gain vestibular, but they don't gain thickness. So what I want around my crown is thickness. No, no, not also uh, vestibular dip. So this right. is a technique that works very good for vestibular dimness or, or for gain vestibular dimness. But to gain thickness, there is no more technique than autogenous graft. A free gingival graft or soft connective tissue graft. Okay, I understood on that one. Uh, let me see here, try to get to a couple that are pretty quick. Do you prefer the 150 or 250 DPTFE membrane in the anterior maxilla uh, or mandible? Uh, I prefer 150. 150. Okay. Are you, are you only anterior, using one in the anterior or Go ahead. I'm I use sorry. both. I have both. Okay. I have both. But, uh, Blake, in Latin America, the distributors of osteogenics, they don't have all, all, all the, all the catalog, you know? So we yeah. have to work with, with what we had, you know? So I, I had that question in every course in Latin America that I, that I, that I make. But in, in real life, you have to, you have the opportunity to choose. You, you have to place a, a thinner, Teflon membrane like Cyoblast 150 for anterior or when you have a, a thin phenotype. If you have a thin phenotype, you have to go with 150. You can use 250. Of course, I, I had used 250, but you have to make sure that not a little bit of the membrane go up. Right. Okay. That that corner of the membrane, you you cannot have sharper corners of the membrane. You have to cut it with a, with a with a circle situation. We, we you cannot leave any sharp uh, uh, sharper edges of the membrane because at two fifty in the thin phenotype could probably fenestration. It could probably have fenestration. Gotcha. I'm going to try to get through. We've probably we're in overtime, so I appreciate everybody hanging around. We've got a couple of couple more questions here that I think we can get to. One of them comes from uh, our friend Justin Tullis up in Denver, uh, actually in Colorado Springs area. But Justin wants to know what are the most common causes of necrosis of a mandibular lingual flap and vertical augmentation, and how do we prevent those complications? Hello, Justin. Um, I haven't seen in my practice any necrosis of the lingual flap with the management that we have learned from the masters 
and we reply in our call, in our in our clinic. I have seen the essence of the of the fenestrate of um, I mean I have seen the essence of the lingual flat when you don't manage them or I have seen fenestration of the lingual flap when you cut with the blade and you leave a very thin periosteum and the next month you will have a fenestration. That's the both situation that I have seen. But I have never seen a necrosis of the lingual flap. Why? Because when you manage the flap to coronal, you don't you are not cutting any vessel. You're pulling the soft connective tissue from the superficial fibers of the mylohyoid. You don't, you're not cutting any, any, any important vessels. So you won't have any necrosis. You will have a stretching flap better than a necrosis flap. So don't worry. Keep that. In mind, erase that phrase of necrosis lingual of your head that you won't have a necrosis or the lingual flap. Okay, perfect. So we've got, uh, I've got two more questions. I know I said that once before. I think this one's really quick. Where do you, and it's from Dr. Nadell. Where do you, I may have mispronounced that. I'm sorry if I did, but where do you typically harvest autograph from? Okay, uh, Dr. Nadell, thanks for the question. Very important. You have to, um, because this is a, a, a not a, a cooking recipe, okay? Uh, and, and, I, and I and I hope I'm 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 seeing very 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 clear with that. You don't you don't have a, a cooking recipe, so you have to analyze your situation. If you're treating anterior region, and you have a very big defect, you have to go for a second size surgery, prefer preferably this size okay the the obliquo line okay why because it's not because of the 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 the, the amount of bmps that you harvest no 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 because it's easier you open the flap and you go straight and scrap it's easier it's very difficult in this region and this region in the mental mental region there's a lot of muscle insertion so patients have a very discomfort when you open here without any necessary, you know, because of the patient has an, a defect here. So if the patient has a defect in, in lower jaw, in the posterior lower jaw, I go a little bit distal of the flap and make one flap and then I took the graft and go a little bit measure to place the graft on my vertical defect. So in posterior region, I only take one region of the surgery. In anterior maxilla, I, if the, is, is this a vertical defect? I'm talking about 10 millimeter defect. I go for a second surgery, but, and I'm going to finish with this. I'm going to finish this question. No, no, I'm going to finish it now. I'm going to finish this question with this. If you're treating anterior maxilla, but you need five millimeters of vertical bone or six millimeter of vertical height that you need only six millimeter i don't i don't go to a second surgery i go a wider flap and go apical from my tooth and i scrap with a micro micro scraper of a safe scraper i scrap apical and recollect and harvest the amount of bone that i need okay but if you don't need a lot of bone graft, you can use the same surgical site. If you need more bone graft, you have to go the second site. And my, my, my preference is here, this, this oblique one line. All right, perfect. Last question here, and it comes from Dr. Dillard. Um, it's a two-part question. So do you, the, the first part of the question is, do you ever do the, the soft tissue grafting with the bone graft? And then the second part, will you just go over the healing times for, for bone grafts and soft tissue grafts? Okay. I, I, I understand. I, I understood the first one. Uh, so okay. I'm going to answer the first one and you please uh, uh, repeat the second one. So the, I, don't, I don't want to do two miracles at the time. Professor Dennis Tarno taught us do one miracle at the time. 
So if I'm going to rebuild bone, if I'm going to graft bone, I, I prefer to make a management of the flap and guarantee the flap tension free of my flap to avoid any complication. If I place a soft tissue graft, I am taking a lot of that, those flap, vale? to, um, to, how do, how do you explain that in English? I, I take a lot of, uh, forces of the flap because those soft connective tissue that I place in the same time or at the same time of the vertical augmentation. If I working with a, with a cytoplasm membrane, a non-resolvable membrane, okay, you don't need to place a soft connective tissue graft uh, on top of the Teflon membrane. Trust me, though that connective tissue, it would be better if you place it over the healing bone when you place the implants, okay? Because it's gonna be on the periosteum and it's gonna receive blood from above. But over the Teflon membrane, mm, I don't like it because you don't, you don't have an, enough vascularization of that. So I prefer to do first the, the, the bone graft and then when I place the implant, the soft connective tissue gram. And the second and the second question? The second part is just about the healing times. So for these vertical ridge mm -hmm. augmentations, how long are you waiting before you go back in? Okay. Yeah, that's Dylan, that's a nice, very nice question. Why? Because I see in all my courses that everybody wants to have a cooking recipe of uh, when I can put the implant. You have to to consider a lot of situation, the age of the patient, the habits of the patient, the bigger is the flap, I mean, the bigger is the defect, the, the larger, the more you have to wait, okay? So if the, if the defect is 10 millimeters, 11 millimeters, I don't know, nine millimeters, I don't want to go uh, uh, the ninth month exactly. I want to wait. Why? Because I have noticed in my practice that when a big defect I reopen at nine months, I can place those implants. Of course I place those implants and get torque of the implants. Of course I get torque of the implants. But the bone crystal has more resorption in the bigger scenarios than if I wait 12 or 14 months. Okay, mm -hmm. so I... I I, I'm not a patient guy. I, I'm not a patient. I, I'm not. I'm not a patient guy. Uh, I have no patience at all. But in, when when we talk about bone augmentation, that's my therapy of being patient. You know, so I have to wait. Okay, I have to wait. That's my psychiatrist therapy. I have to wait. Okay, so bigger is the defect. Whether is the is the, is the healing time of of placing those implants. I want to. Uh, make sure that the superficial, the superficial bone that is in touch with the Teflon membrane got a lot of mature time that place the implant and had less resorption than if I open or reopen at six months or maybe nine months. I hope that questions, I hope that answer helps you a lot. So, and then just just real briefly on this one, because I know people are ready to go and I appreciate your time. What's the, what about soft tissue grafting? How long are you waiting for the, the soft tissue grafting to heal? Three months. Three months. Okay. Always three months. Yeah. The, 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 the same the same uh, clinical situation with with root coverage. When you do a soft connective tissue to root coverage to to make a, a coronal advanced flap for root coverage you cannot take any determination of your success le less than three months of healing. You have to wait three months of healing and you guarantee that the, ma the gingival margin is not going to move. So this, the, the, the soft tissue uh, complete his total healing in three months. So e every three months you can do a uh, soft connective tissue graph. Okay, great, great and very thorough answer. I really appreciate that. So we've come, we've come to the end. We've gone a little bit over time here. I appreciate everybody for sticking around. 
Uh, but Dr. Gallo, fantastic presentation. Thanks so much for, for joining us. Thanks for sharing your wealth of knowledge with us. Uh, it's been a great presentation and I know that everybody's listening is also very thankful to you. So thank you again for graciously sharing your time with us tonight. Thank you, Blake. If I, if I, if I allow to say a uh, little things, uh, I, um, I want to say, uh, thanks to, to Steve for, for organize all this, uh, platform. Uh, thank you, uh, to all the people from Osteogenics, uh, uh, Shelly, uh, Kendra, uh, Eric, you, Shane, everybody, everybody. Uh, if I miss someone, I'm sorry. But thank you very much. Uh, we'll, we'll keep in touch. I hope you to see you soon and please say hello to everybody in Oxygenic. And once again, thank you very much for this opportunity, Blake. Thank you, Dr. Guy. I appreciate it. Uh, can't wait to see you again sometime soon. All right. Well, thanks everybody. Uh, we, we appreciate you joining with us today and, and hope you have a great rest of the day. We'll talk to you later. Goodbye.